you. Thank you. <laughs> Start it okay, over. Okay, bud, you're good, you're good. <laughs> hey, guys, welcome to Thoughts Ease Interviews, the show where we seize the thoughts of our guests while we play games of Magic the Gathering. I'm Lucas Frank. With me, as always, is my co-host, Zachary Cole-Smith. And today, we're joined by Kristen Hader of Lingua Ignota. Kristen, welcome to the show. Good evening. Thank you for having me. Thank you. I'm so glad no one was here to see what just happened. <laughs> we, had a, we had a rough start there, but, but we're, we're back on track. <laughs> Kristen, we're a Magic the Gathering themed talk show host here. And so I have to ask, are you familiar with the game Magic the Gathering at all? I'm familiar, but I haven't dabbled in any uh, any actual active participation in the game. Good. That that's how that's kind of how we like it here. Okay, good. <laughs> so every week we we you know, for for each guest, we kind of put together a deck that, in some way, will speak like to the artist's body of work or to something um, that we feel like fits the artist. And we have, there's a you know huge amount of cards to draw from, so we've put together a little something for you. Um, this Amazing. is basically a uh, Mardu Aristocrats deck, which uh, might mean nothing to you. We have a couple cards here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, I guess. So the main thing with this deck, the 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 like the way the deck works is we want our creatures to die, and so you know you have a song all bitches die, mm -hmm. all these all these bitches will die, and that's kind of <laughs> how how the deck works. Uh, it, it revolves okay. around all all of our all of our creatures dying and and hitting our opponents for damage. So uh, we have a card here, butcher of the horde, uh, nice, which is a. Uh, to go along with your song Butcher of the World. Yes. Uh, we, of course, have our namesake card here, Thoughtseize. Happy to be playing that. And then uh, you have a song, Do You Doubt Me, Traitor? We have the traitor himself, Kalidus, Traitor of Get. Wow. So this is kind of the basic deck we're going to be playing, and uh, I'm going to cue it into a league right now, and we'll get started. Kristen, i got to ask you, when you first heard the name of this show, did you think thought sees or did you think thought sees like my little thought sees running around my head <laughs> uh, well the the way that it was presented to me was via text so i did have the appropriate uh the appropriate sees <laughs> okay offended. so but i i was thinking earlier today about thought sees my little thought sees would be yeah you're having some thought sees some yeah. thoughtsies. Tell me your yeah. thoughtsies. Because it goes from like really badass to to, <laughs> to my little thoughtsies. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, um, so you have a uh, sort of cursory knowledge of magic, uh, but um, I wanted to ask about um, any experience with um, the world of fantasy, gaming, fantasy books. Uh, anything like that? Any movies, games, board games? Could be any or none of the above. Um, gosh. I mean, not really. I don't really have any experience with this kind of zone. Awesome. We love that. Um, so you've talked about like world building uh, in regards to your albums and, and the project at large. Um, this is a term that gets used in game design circles or like sci-fi fantasy realm um, of like books, movies, music. Um, could you talk a little bit more about what uh, you mean by world building? Yeah, of course. Um, the way I see it is that um, I think about it in terms of creating kind of a mythology related to the project because it borrows from, but doesn't belong to any particular genre. It borrows from um, from different kind of sects of metal, from noise, from folk music, um, from various like European forms of folk music, um, classical music, but it doesn't really fit into any of those spots. And so it kind of, um, the world building relates to um, carving out my own kind of path that it, or my own world that exists nowhere but is solely mine. So I take um, 
and this relates to like text and lyrics as well and and the kind of sources that I use for all the work I want to have this like um this resource of different um like motives and motifs that I can pull from throughout the duration of the project and so in um in earlier works, I can pull from things that I've done before and put them in uh, into new songs, um, whether that be you know lyrics or or music related or sonic things. Um, and so there's kind of like ongoing rivulets and tributaries throughout the project, I guess. I like referring to them as um, tributaries or rivulets. Um, I find the whole, you know, what genre is this music discussion insanely just boring. Um, <laughs> and when I listen to your music, it feels like you look for cohesion um, in, you know, through lines in different places, you know, places other than what genre of music am I trying to make? Right. Um, so I guess you kind of just touched on that just now. Um, but can you talk a little bit more about... Um, what constitutes a through line or a tributary for you uh, on your album? Is it lyrical? Um, what what piece? What ends up piecing things together and making it feel like its own whole world to you? Yeah, um, I think I use this kind of like pastiche style uh, and it's very kind of postmodern of like putting things together that don't seem to make sense mm. and I think that one of one of those tributaries and things that I'm kind of notorious for using at this point is like um, sharp contrast and taking something that is um, for instance like juxtaposing something that's very hard with something that's very soft or like docile and um taking you know maybe like a really what i would find to be like a very brutal or graphic lyric and laying it over something that's very um sweet and lovely musically or doing the opposite and having um something that's like hyper aggressive sonically but that doesn't have any real like lyrical content or like any substance to it um and it's just like aggressive sounding but doesn't actually have anything to it which is kind of my my own um interest in like metal conceits and that kind of like hyper aggression that maybe doesn't really mean much to the people performing it sometimes and not always of course but it's just like that that kind of thing um and and then finding ways to make those juxtapositions then work in, in like a larger context in an album context or, or something like that. Um, that's probably one. And then taking all of, uh, you know, when the project started, it was this like giant, it was based in my graduate work. Um, and it was this like giant block of text. And I just took everything from um, that text, which was my thesis and put it into the project and so that 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 kind of like biblical uh violent um thematic material in the text is kind of like works throughout the project i think or it has been one of the major through lines um you give more of yourself than most artists do in your work i would say i, I saw someone ask you once online how do you scream every night like that without hurting your voice and your response was i hurt my voice um, <laughs> and you've also talked about um cringing at the phrase self-care yeah. giving yourself concussions on tour exploding light bulbs on your head the list goes on and on making yeah. your body part of the performance with the tattoo um yeah. if i were your family member or a loved one i would i would be worried about you <laughs> And I'd imagine this this comes up a lot. Will you will you talk a little bit about that with us? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that historically, I have not been good at taking care of myself, and historically, do not take care of myself at all. I tend to live in a zone of kind of like extremes, and this uh, partially comes from. 
um, I have a, I had a long history of, uh, an eating disorder, um, of anorexia for about 12 or 13 years. And, um, in that I was, I mean, its sole purpose is to kind of like slowly destroy your body through like intense, rigorous self-discipline and like exercising all day and restricting. So for me, like bodily harm doesn't affect me, I think, as as much as other people. I can kind of like uh, numb out my body or like dissociate to an extent where it, it doesn't um, it it doesn't affect me in the moment. But um, I think a lot of the performance is really just kind of like um, reenactment of violence, I guess. And I, I don't think I realized that initially. Um, I thought it was just just performative, but it really is. It is reenactment. And um, it's very, uh, I, I don't have very much control. I have like enough control to be able to perform and to be able to have like technical um, precision to some extent, but I don't have enough control to like stop hurting myself. So I think probably the worst injury I got um, playing was I did give myself like a compound concussion in Europe uh, from bonking myself in the head with uh, big shop lights. Um, and like, I still deal with the consequences and repercussions of that today. Like I still have vision issues uh, and like some auditory things that happen because of that. But um, at this point, I'm, I don't know if I can perform that way much longer. Um, it is uh, incredibly taxing, and it's especially taxing when I'm on tour, I think. Uh, and at a certain point, like, my body just wants to, like, give out. Um, so, yeah. A lo uh, longevity was my next question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, sorry, I think, keep going. Sure. I, uh, I think that um, over... I think that I will find a new way to create intensity around the performance that isn't like that, that again, like that builds on the way that I've been doing it in the past, but that maybe is like a different iteration of it. And I'm interested to see how, how I can do that or um, different ways of making that happen, I guess. So I think it's, it's about being kind of like adaptable and being, being like, oh, this doesn't work anymore. Like it fucking hurts too much mm -hmm. and I can't do it uh, and like stay alive. So um, switching it into something that is hopefully as uh, interesting to watch and interesting to do, but is less harmful, I guess. Well, kind of going off, um, you know, what you were just saying and, and that previous question, like feels to me like in our current music economy there's this expectation that you know on top of the fact that artists are generally unable to make a living wage yeah um they're expected to like visibly renounce the the pursuit of material gain and like yeah. along these same lines there seems to be this expectation of musicians and artists to like make a show of sacrificing themselves to their work that like their mm -hmm. creative output like imbues the music with this like surplus value yeah and it's like a, it's like a the, like a gift to the the capitalist music economy but do you mm -hmm. find that there is this kind of like an alternative type of power in sacrificing yourself to such anti-patriarchal and anti-capitalist music um yes i i do i do think so and i, to, I totally understand what you're saying um i think that it became apparent that it had a cathartic power for for people watching i'm not sure how cathartic it would it was for me i think initially maybe it was but eventually it was just like uh just kind of destructive um but i think that it resonating with and giving some kind of like um some kind of peace or solace to the people who are uh, also present for the performance um, mm -hmm. allows them to become 
kind of as much a part of it as I am. Um, and that's that was another thing about like I, I like to play on the floor. I like to play with people. I like to play with the room and to have everyone be lit or not lit at certain points um, with me so that it's it, much more about us than it is about me and the, the kind of like collective uh, trauma and healing, I guess. Yeah, you've talked about um, vicarious trauma when mm-hmm. discussing your performance. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think, um, I think again, it's about uh, the the performance is a lot about reenactment and reenacting violence that has been done to me and violence that I've witnessed. Um, and it, but that kind of violence is not specific to me or is not mine solely that I own. It belongs to a lot of other people as well. And so um, I think that one of the the major things that people take from my music is a sense that um, I as much as you and you as much as I um, have suffered in this way and that we, I am this kind of like in some ways, a, a vessel for um, for others um, in the room, um, and I don't mean that in like I hope that's not like an egotistical thing, uh, but no. just that like I I um, I take uh, I take the pain for all of us for for a moment. Um, I think, yeah. Um. Well, I guess, you know, this is kind of a big question and I'm just, you know, curious to hear um, your thoughts on it. But are, I guess, related to my last question, are are art and capitalism inherently at odds? Like, can subversive and anti-capitalist music thrive under a capitalist system? That's an excellent question. (laughs) Um... I really want to think about that and give that like a full, full pause. Um, I think if we look at like art historically, if we look at um, works that have been subversive or like outside of academic context, outside of like political context, but have still existed in capitalist society. I do think that there are models for that and paradigms for that, and that there have been works that do that. Um, I definitely think it is, I think it's possible, but I think it's about really kind of infiltrating and subverting the system, like really understanding capitalism to be able to work both within it and to um, somehow um, reach beyond it. Uh, I think, you know, inherently capitalism is the fucking worst (laughs) and, uh, and we're all fucked, but, um, that's going to be the header for this episode. (laughs) (laughs) Um, and especially now it's incredibly difficult to, it is incredibly difficult to make like anti-capitalist or subversive music within the, the system in which we live. But I do think there are ways around it. Um, it's just a matter of, yeah, again, really knowing, uh, being close to your enemy as it were. Totally. Uh, your music has a lot of biblical references of course and religious imagery and um just as an aside i'd like to mention here that your um twitter handle is lingua sad christian mom ignota (laughs) um your parents raised you in the church but you became uh disillusioned at a young age can you can you talk about what caused you to leave when you were younger and where your relationship with organized religion stands now yeah, it's uh, my relationship with organized religion is very complicated at this point. I've kind of been describing myself as like post Christian or post Catholic lately. <laughs> I, <laughs> uh, um, 
I definitely, um, I think that organized religion is just kind of intrinsically a, a gigantic evil, which is responsible for so much oppression and evil, um, and for enforcing the, you know, patriarchal models and, um, and I, uh, I think when I was about 11 or 12, I just started to actually question whether this was something that I believed. And when you're indoctrinated into religion, of course, you, when you're indoctrinated into anything at a young age, I think you just believe that to be true until you are exposed to enough stuff to believe otherwise. And I just decided that I didn't believe in God. Um, and I remember telling my dad this in the car on the way home from Sunday school and being like, mm. I just don't think I believe in God. And he was like, that's okay. He was wow. like, yeah, it was crazy. Um, I, he was like, that's okay. He's like, you know, I think of God and religion as a way to, you know, organize my life and it gives me a set of rules to live by to be a good person. Mm. And I think that's what... Um, I think that's what a lot of people think of it as, but they also don't, I think a lot of people also don't understand the really oppressive qualities of it. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of how I came to that zone of being like atheist. And now I just like, I don't even know, man. Like I, I really enjoy the, the imagery and the kind of I was just talking with uh, with Lex upstairs the other day about like I, I went to parochial school when I was a kid um, from like the f kindergarten through sixth grade. And I was like, does being physically abused by nuns count as trauma? And he was mm. like, yes. Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> oh, that's so it's like so weird to think about because that's just like that's how I grew up is like mm. having a nun like throw me across the room or like tell mm. me I'm in the fucking doghouse and I'm a bad kid and shit and like uh so I do definitely have like weird religious trauma surrounding my childhood and stuff but um I really I'm like just obsessed with and really attached to the imagery surrounding it and like the severity and austerity and the pageantry and drama of religious imagery i think cole and i are both sober uh and members of aa where Excellent. there's this idea of a um a higher power of your own understanding how does something like that strike you that's a hard one because i'm in uh i'm in 12 step as well and i've done um i've done work in AA and NA um, in, in my early 20s. But at this point, I do um, I do CODA and Al-Anon. Um, and for me, it's like I try to think of the program as the higher power mm -hmm. um, and that I can trust the program and uh, the people in my program as um, kind of the guiding light, as it were. Uh, so yeah, but that I, the the spiritual religious aspect of of twelve step is definitely a challenge. Um, it is something that like people get hung up on so easily at the beginning, and it's like a big hurdle. You know, it was for me. I was just like, well, I don't, you know, I don't believe in God, so this won't work. But mm -hmm. you know, I think the revolution in the program is that it is this like God of your own understanding, and it can be anything. It can be it's anything bigger than yourself, and like right. you know. A, there's a lot of stuff bigger than us, you know? Absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I, uh, I tell my sponsees that it's, or sponsee single, <laughs> that it's, uh, a, the higher power is a place to put things that are out of your control. It's a, you know, we turn, turn these things over. And, uh, that relates in, in the sense that I have a, I have a quote here from you, um, all caps on Twitter, that which you try to control, in fact, controls you, my dogs. <laughs> I, I quite liked. Um, just as a quick aside. Um, yeah. Werner Herzog often puts religious music in new and interesting contexts, mm -hmm. like um, in Encounters at the End of the World, he uses Bulgarian Orthodox music um, for deep sea footage and describes divers preparing to go under the ice as priests preparing for mask. 
or in uh, Herzog Glass, Heart of Glass. You've mentioned the uh, uh, Chanteray pour mon courage, excuse mm-hmm. the pronunciation, of, of the film. Um, can you talk about what that film, that particular scene where that song comes up, um, and uh, how all of that informed uh, Do You Doubt Me, Traitor? Yeah. Um, first of all, Werner Herzog for me is like so huge such like a massive figure in my life and in the way that I think about art and the way that I think about making art I think there's a realism to what he does that nobody else has been able to do and like a true dedication and like maniacal um absolute like I'm going to do this insane thing maniacal Uh, is a good description I think Mm yeah yeah uh, to his work and I think that was his his music direction in films is like one of the things that really attracted me to him when I was a teenager and started watching his stuff and I was just that's actually one of the things that influences what I was talking about earlier that juxtaposition of like hard and soft is thinking about Werner Herzog and the way that he uses music to in really surprising and wonderful ways to augment um, certain visual or contextual things happening in the movies. So that that scene, um, wh- what is it called? Like the the island at the end of the world or the island mm-hmm. at the end of time or something um, is just so fucking beautiful and just like really devastating. And um, I love, he does these kind of, sometimes in the films, he he does these really beautiful shots that are just like static shots of like a, a group of people that are just like, uh, that are just motionless and like these kind of like tableau vivant shots. Um, and I love those. Um, it's just like a really wonderful sequence about, um, doubt and hopelessness and um the kind of the end of the endless horizon um and then that that song the chanterai um is i remember hearing it and being like what the fuck is that uh being like 16 years old or whatever and it took me a long time to find it and when i found it i just i started singing it because it reminded me of that that passage in the film um and uh it's it's always just kind of like a, an ongoing melody in my head i guess and so i i decided to put it into um do you doubt me traitor um in in a way and i um i started singing the chanterai like live for for part of a tour as a way to like start sets um and then it morphed into being like the the part the end part of do you doubt me traitor um and then i wrote that into the the uh the album um so yeah that the, that kind of polyphonic ending um does go back to like my teenage years and just being like really obsessed with Werner Herzog um yeah <laughs> Can you, um, I have this, I have the same experience with Werner Herzog. I, there are mm-hmm. songs in his movies that I'm still trying to find to this day, I, yeah. physically or on the internet. Yeah. And, and I, after there's like my life before Werner and my life after I feel, um, and, um, and I, I don't mean that hyperbolically, like it, it really yeah. changed how I, how I see things. Um, Can and I you, ask, what is, yeah. what's the first one you saw? I think it was I think it was Grizzly Man. Same. Um, and then from there, the one that really got sent me down the rabbit hole was um, Encounters at the End of the World. Mm. I, I I love that movie so much. And then from there, I started watching his his non documentary ones. And I just watched Wojciech last night, actually, Wojciech which I had never so seen. Sick. Yeah, it's yeah. really rough. Yeah. Um, and I and I I, I actually. I, this might be problematic to say, but I love Kinski. I can't get enough of watching Kinski. And you recently in quarantine watched My Best Fiend. Um, yes. Can you talk a little bit about that movie for us here? <laughs> um, My Best Fiend is a, a somewhat of a documentary of, that Werner Herzog made about the 
the contentious working relationship and friendship between Herzog and Kinski, and ultimately about how Kinski was truly a lunatic um, and a very a huge asshole and a very brilliant, unhinged energy um, who would go to it very extravagant lengths to enrage and provoke his audience and everyone around him, like true, like dark triad, narcissist, sociopath style. Um, and, but it's, it's also about how they made each other better, Herzog and Kinski and how together they, um, they really augmented the other's craft, I guess. Um, it's a really fascinating film. Uh, it's, pr it's probably like one of my favorite Herzog films. Um, the Kinski butterfly scene is just so in the context of the movie is so yeah. beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is it unfair to call Kinski an infiltrator? I mean, he like, you know, going, going to his, all his fans and screaming at them. What does he say? I, I'm not your, I'm not your superstar. And just acting in this unhinged way and just redefining what people think of as, as, you know, a, a, uh, a, a star for the time. And yeah. I mean, I mean, there's some, sometimes I feel like he's Kaufman-esque and I feel like that's maybe giving him too much credit. Mm. Like maybe he's just actually a psychopath. And he's, he's not, <laughs> he doesn't know what he's doing. Um, is that unfair? What do you think of that? I don't think that's unfair. I think he, I think he is. I think he's like a major provocateur and, um, I, th I think like Kaufman-esque is a really good way to describe it. Um, I'm sure there was a level of like um, of awareness in what he was doing and also just in in awareness and intention, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and the, yeah, like the Jesus tours and stuff yeah. are just like fucking madness. It's just crazy. Yeah, for uh, those who for those who don't know, Kinski would go on these tours where he would tell everyone that he was Jesus. Come up and fight me. Tell me I'm not. Basically, so insane. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but a terrible, terrible man. Um, <laughs> terrible man. Uh, but yeah, he just. I don't know. I don't. I don't think he really did anything else that was good aside from the Herzog films. I think he did like hundreds of terrible films and like he was in i think he was in wasn't he in dr Zhivago? um mm -hmm. and that's it so that's it's a really strange that like only herzog could bring out his uh on his wily beauty i guess um so i guess something i wanted to talk a little bit about is um your academic history and I don't want to, I'm not trying to like lead you in any direction with this question. Um, so feel free to respond however you, however you want, but there's, you know, there's, there's this, a focus in the press on your origins in academia as a way of framing your body of work that mm -hmm. it emerged out of this academic context. But when you've spoken about your own experience in academia, it seems to have been also an experience of trauma um, with academia being, you know, yet another institutional expression of, of white dominant uh, patriarchal culture. So have you yeah. found that this framing of your work by the overwhelmingly white college educated music press is one that serves like as an attempt to recontextualize your work into something that's emergent from a patriarchal institution rather than as a meaningful confrontation of it? That's an interesting question. Um, it's difficult um, because the academic component of the um, when people lend something the like academic stamp it gives it like kind of automatic credibility mm -hmm. um 
because that's that's what we think of as like, oh, this must be smart. This person must know what they're talking about. I can't tell you how many people I met at Brown University or met like doing doing work in my courses who were incredibly brilliant and who were making things that just did nothing. Um, it's like, here's here's the thing I made, marvel at it, but it doesn't do anything mm. for, for anyone. It's just like a, a thing that you made at a fancy school and it will only exist there. And then by contrast, like seeing stuff in the Providence noise scene that has like changed my life. Um, and not in an academic context at all. But um, I feel like the the academic piece does give me a, a like the appearance of some sort of credibility and that I, um, and I think that makes music critics like a little more likely to listen to what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So then again, it's kind of up to me to subvert that expectation and to kind of like um create um things within that cr credibility that are then like not credible um and that exist outside of that zone so in particular like with this new record i do a lot of stuff that like is totally outside of um that's just like kind of in some parts like just poorly done with no f finesse that nobody could ever say is like academically good. So it's complicated to, um, to kind of remove yourself from the academic context, uh, or to try to, I don't know. That's a, that's a really good question. I don't feel like I answered it that well. No, I think but, that's, um, a, that's a great answer. Yeah. I'll have to think about that more. Well, this sort of builds off of it. I mean, DIY versus academia, your your work seems to be living proof that they don't have to be mutually exclusive. I mean, you've even mentioned friends who were pulled in to Brown via their work in the DIY scene, right? That's right. Yeah. Um, and uh, can you talk about how each has played a role in your work? Do you Do you feel that you sometimes have to like shake the shackles of academia out of your brain do you view it as as limiting in any way or do you do you find that it you know can you talk about the the, the relationship of those two things in your work yeah absolutely um when i was in uh when i was doing my graduate work um at brown i was um i was also hoping to get into the the phd program in electronic music um multimedia electro i forget what the fuck the program is called i think it's defunct now um but like to, to go on and get my phd and i uh there and i was really really like gung-ho on doing that i thought that's what i was going to do with my life was mm. just go to school and become a professor go to school eternally and then figure out you know how to teach other people um and i think when I started making the work I was making about my current life experiences uh, of, of domestic violence and, and whatnot, I, um, people were really into it. Yeah. My, my thesis was like, it was presented as like, this is a retelling of Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. Mm -hmm. And the, all the professors were like, so psyched. They're like, Oh, we love the Rite of Spring. It's the most important piece of music of the 20th century. <laughs> and then it was like, well, actually it's like, it's also about porno grind and gendered, uh, violence and like, um, and then they were just like, wait a second. No, you can't do that here. <laughs> And then I was like, I was immediately out of the running to be in the program, um, just because my work was too, like, it was, it was too, it was too female and too, um, confrontational. And, uh, and so I took that work and I put it into the DIY context and put it into like, started performing in the scene in, in Providence. And that's where it kind of found its home. Um, and 
to this day, I don't know if I would feel, I mean, I, w I was able to do some, some residencies uh, based off of my work in school, but at this point, I don't know if I'd be comfortable really performing in the academic zone mm -hmm. um, again. But yeah, that's, that's kind of how it moved to, to the other space. Your covers feel like you've invited songs into the distorted, harrowing realm of lingua ignota, where they then either become changed by their environment or are changed by the context, like a shirtless, buff Chris Isaac wandering around a burning church is kind of what it feels <laughs> like to me. Can you tell us anything about where you were when you decided to pick Chris and Dolly Parton as your next victims for, for your covers? <laughs> um, I think that I chose I, I tend to choose songs that kind of I feel relate to what I'm dealing with in my life in some way uh, at that point but um, I've always loved uh, Wicked Game and I've always loved Jolene, um, just just as songs in and of themselves. And um, I like to give them, or I thought that by performing them, it would put them, yeah, put them into the realm of like my very upsetting world. Um, and just, I don't know, just. trying to take something pre-existing and give it a different context, I guess. There is this, um, I used to teach, or I, t I taught a course um, while I was a grad student um, about voice and uh, the, the course was called The Voice of Text. And uh, we had one course where I would talk about context and how, um, how, different context gives voice um, different meaning. And we looked at the song, Just the Two of Us, um, and we looked at, you know, Just the Two of Us, uh, the Bill Withers version, mm -hmm. and then Just the Two of Us, uh, Eminem's version, and then Just the Two of Us, uh, Tori Amos's version, and just how, like, vastly different the meaning became based on, like, the voice of and, and the experience of whoever was singing it. Um, and like the Bill Withers is obviously about like, a you know, a, a parental relationship or not, not a parental relationship, a romantic relationship. And then, uh, Eminem's version is about his relationship with his, uh, child. And then, um, and then the Tori Amos, Tori Amos's version is, uh, to some extent, like twisting that, uh, and reframing it as like, um, control and uh feminine trauma so it's just like a you know the same lyrics the same song but just a completely different experience based on whoever um who's ever hands it's in um we've just lost this game uh okay we've been doing a lot, we've been doing a lot of losing no we're doing, we're doing okay we're doing okay <laughs> just just you know checking in um Okay, so so Kristen, you've watched the show before. You know our segment, uh, blank, or Magic: The Gathering card. Uh huh. Um, the segment tonight is called Nine Inch Nails Song, or Magic: The Gathering card. Okay. Lucas put this one together. Thank you, Lucas, for doing doing my work for me. No problem. And for the record, we're we're trying to trick you here. The goal is to is to screw you up. So no no feel bads if if you get stuff wrong. It's kind of a mean bit in some ways. But <laughs> <laughs> all right, you ready? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Number one, destroy the evidence. Um. Magic the Gathering? It's a Magic the Gathering card uh, from Ravnica. Okay, yes. number two, The Great Destroyer. Nine Inch Nails. Yep, year zero. Um, number three, Lingering Souls. Magic? You got it. We've we've actually got two in our hand right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
The Hall of Souls. Uh, magic. That is Nine Inch Nails off of the oh. Quake soundtrack. Is that what that is? The Quake soundtrack. Um, a soundtrack? Did I pick put a soundtrack on there? <laughs> That's mean. <laughs> 1996. Uh, oh, it doesn't say soundtrack. Okay. Uh, number five, Dread so, Horde. So, damn. Dread Horde Butcher. Uh, magic. That's magic. Okay, we got number six, Ruiner. Magic. No, that's off the downward spiral. Nine Inch Nails. What? Oh, oh my god. I'm so embarrassed. Of course don't it be, is. Don't be embarrassed. We're trying to trick you. Uh, yeah, the only person who got them all was I think Carrie got all the Slipknot ones. <laughs> <laughs> Props to carry. Um, yeah, uh, he just guessed lucky. Uh, okay, number seven, Eater of Days. Eater of Days. Nine Inch Nails? That is Magic the Gathering from Dark Steel, but we have number eight, The Eater of Dreams. Oh my god. Nine Inch Nails? Mm-hmm. That is Nine Inch Nails off uh, Hesitation Marks. Okay, number nine, Reptilian Reflection. Magic? It's magic. I've never heard of that card. Lucas, what is that? I don't know. It's a, I just said deep cut. Sounds, <laughs> sounds tight. Yeah, it's bad. It's not a good card. <laughs> All right, number 10, Damnation. Uh, nine Inch Nails? It's magic. Oh, my God. One of my favorite really cards. I would be so bad at this. I would get so many of these wrong. Uh, okay, number 11, Wrath of God. Magic? Yep. What a mean game this is. <laughs> what, a, what a wicked game. <laughs> All right. Uh, number 12, God Given. Nine Inch Nails? That is Nine Inch Nails off Wish. Uh, Number 13, Lights in the Sky. Oh my god. (laughs) Fuck. Magic? That nine is, you got it, Lucas. Nine Inch Nails from. Right, well, I guess you, you. I guess you wrote this, so you already knew the answers. That's Nine Inch Nails from the slip. All right, we got two more. Light up the stage. Nine Inch Nails. It's magic, Lucas's favorite card. <laughs> and the very that last one. Because it says stage in it, too. That's true. <laughs> All right, last one The Cursed Clock. <laughs> so mean. I'm just thinking of that Metallica song where he's just where he's like, my lifestyle determines my death style. Tick, 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 talk. That's the only thing I can think of right now because I'm so horrified by how terrible I've done at this segment. Um, this is this has to be oh, fuck, fuck. I'm gonna guess wrong. It's Nine Inch Nails. No, you're right. You guess right. Yeah. All right, how I, was <laughs> together. I was like a whole you got 10 out of 15 that's not that bad that's not, bad. That's not good yeah but when I was putting this together I was like holy shit Nine Inch Nails has <laughs> so much music like there are so many albums I was I like there's then there's How to Destroy Angels there's the film scores I mean yeah. there's so much music those guys have done over the years it's pretty incredible um, and everyone does pretty bad except for Carrie for some weird reason. Because um, <laughs> so, it was Slipknot. 
Because it was Slipknot. <laughs> Loser. Um, anyway, um, you describe yourself as a people pleaser. Yeah. Um, and I love your music very much, but I would not describe it as people pleasing music. No. How does uh, making challenging music engage with the people pleasing side of you or do the two selves relate or interact in some way? Yeah, it's very strange. Um, I am a very in real life, like, uh, or in, in, in my <laughs> life. In <real> life. Uh, <laughs> I am generally a very like sweet kind of tacit demure person who doesn't say no to anything or anybody. And that's part of my codependency issues. Um, it's like, I can't say no. Um, and so the project I see almost as, yeah, it's definitely not people pleasing, but it's a way to circumnavigate that and um, express how I really feel, I guess. <laughs> um, but I, um, the uh, the thing to remember maybe or that the way that i am able to uh consider it like part of myself is that i look at, like almost none of the lyrics are mine i didn't write most of it there's a lot of like appropriation and sampling of things and like radical recontextualization of stuff mm -hmm. biblical and you know um otherwise so I get to kind of take other people's language and put it into um, some mode of expression that I can't access myself in my day-to-day -day life, I guess. Um, <laughs> different, different type of question. So I've heard you've been watching the bachelor. Oh yes. Nice. I, I've I've been watching uh, a lot uh, the, the yeah. past couple seasons, but uh, it seems to me like this show is almost scientifically engineered to both create and process trauma in real time simultaneously, and I feel like it's evolved over decades from a culture of like like she's so hot or like whatever like the, yeah. the original seasons are just have a different flavor, and now it's one of like this almost weaponized wokeness where conversation has been filtered through layers of just like woke speak jargon like you know thank you for sharing your truth like taking responsibility yeah. like showing showing <laughs> up but <laughs> do these types of signifiers belie the ultimate truth of the bachelor which is really one of like institutionalized gaslighting exploitation and trauma where the premise of the show relies on the fact that the vast majority of participants will fail spectacularly. <laughs> I love this question. Nice. Um, <laughs> uh, yes. Yes. Um, to me, the bachelor, to me, the bachelor is about is one of like my inspirations for world building actually, because mm. they themselves have like the franchise is built on this mythology of like all of these, like you said, like the faux, like wokeness phraseology and like, um, very like Western embedded ideas of romantic heterosexual cishet love. Yep. And, um, uh, over and over again like creates these incredibly traumatic situations for contestants and um who are like somehow willing participants in order to gain um influence and social capital um afterwards or at least for the past few seasons i actually um we listened to this podcast called game of roses which takes the bachelor and um breaks it into like sports analysis and looks at all of all of that phraseology and all of the um, different kinds of like dates that people go on and um, and all of like the imagery and whatnot and and breaks it down into like what things are successful, who in the game is a good player. Um, wow. And yeah, it's it's fascinating and so well done. I highly recommend that podcast. 
Um, but I've been thinking of it a lot in those terms now that like that the bachelor is like a game mm -hmm. uh, and or a sport and you have to the contestants have to navigate all of these like have to navigate this world using the correct language using the correct um, appearance and like physical presentation and uh, in order to win the ring or the crown or whatever <laughs> um so it's just it's like a fascinating totally grotesque like awful anthropological experiment i love it and right now it's going it's like total bedlam and chaos because they're having all of these like terrible issues with racism and like racism in the show and racism in the contestants and pe people are finally like um it, being vocal about that and exploring that and trying to, you know, get some uh, different um, or trying to get, you know, the franchise uh, into a place where it's like not as terrible as it has been. Uh, so it's just like I, I'm on like the Bachelor Reddit like all day long. I'm no like, <laughs> I, I have That's my awesome. only burner account is a Bachelor account where I just follow all the contestants and like, Wow. It's I'm I'm a disgusting person. It's it's terrible. Right. Um but yeah, I'm really obsessed with The Bachelor. Uh, I'd like to quote you. This it's... season of The Bachelorette is like therapy salon. They made this guy write a letter to his inner child and scream at a rock. He was V scared. <laughs> they're they're all trapped at the resort, mostly stripped naked, humiliated. She demands more vulnerability, more, more, more. It is sadistic. <laughs> You're talking about a, Jason, and then they sent him home. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck, man. He went home after that. Oh god, that was so terrible. That season was awful. Um but yeah, he's just like man that was a that was a great moment and she was talking about like her previous season on um el bachelor uh juan pablo season and she's like i brought my dress that i wore on that season i'm going to burn it and release my release myself from that toxic relationship and then she makes him write a letter to his inner child and it's like so it's like so brutal and he's like i have all these demons and i don't want them to come out and it's just like oh god it's awful <laughs> uh, but it's, it's so good at the same time just a, yeah it is it's an incredibly sadistic show incredibly sadistic okay we're okay. S shifting back you were about to go on <laughs> at a uh, metal festival <laughs> when you realized there were some toxic shithead bands on the bill that you did not want to be associated with, but ultimately decided to play the show to force the audience to contend with you. Can you talk about your role as an infiltrator in the metal sp in the metal scene and how you view p performing on occasion to an audience full of, you know, neckbeards, I guess? It ha it happens often. Um, I... Th Ugh. It's, it, it's been difficult to navigate. It's been very difficult to navigate. It's hard. Um, that particular fest that happened was in, I think, Denmark. And I was on tour with Author and Punisher. And nobody knew that the band is called Talk, T-A-A-K. And I, I was just like looking over the lineup as we were at the show about to play. And I'm just like, oh fuck like this fucking band is on here and it's like you're also like watching the other bands and you're like looking at like their logos and shit and i'm just like i don't i don't know if this is okay like i don't what this doesn't seem this looks like a, i don't know about mm -hmm. this band and it's just like it's um and i was like you know talking to tristan and talking to our booking agent and stuff and i was like none of us wanted to do it really at that point we we're just like and our merch is like right next to talks it's like fucking shit mm. like that sucks um but ultimately i was like well fuck them like i'm i'm gonna like i'm an opener at the show like i'm not a big act at all at this point and like i i'm like i'm going to show them that i 
am here and I am a different perspective and you have to contend with it. And this is what I, I went through a lot kind of in the beginning when I was touring with the body often and I've played a lot of metal shows. It's like I'm constantly having to prove myself as like worthy to this community that I don't even particularly want to be a part of. Mm -hmm. um, but that like that I'm a credible vocalist and musician and I get up there and I don't have any instruments. I just have like my keyboard and my computer and I don't have cool gear and I'm just like, but I have to like seize and destroy the room all by myself. And so that's what I tried to do there was be like, you fucks will listen to me. You will fucking listen to me. And it kind of worked at that show. Like they were into it somewhat but i think like going in, going into those situations and changing people's minds or getting them to self-reflect in any way if i can is is like a huge win for me it's like i've had people come up to me after shows like men come up to me and say like hey i have been an abuser and you have made me think about my actions and i felt ashamed watching you perform and i felt like i wanted to change wow and um, and I think it's also like, it's been hard, you know, with, uh, with the label I was on with profound lore and they've put out some stuff that like, I really do not associate myself with ideologically. And it's like, I didn't know at the time I was signing, but I get a lot of shit for it. Um, and it's just like, <clears throat> I can't change things that have happened that people have already done, but I can try to infiltrate that zone and force people to contend with me instead and contend with like a different voice. Um, and I think in, in to a certain extent, like that was success successful. Like I, I infiltrated this like extreme metal zone um, that has credibility in the in the world of extreme metal, and I I think I'm the top selling record on that label, but um, it's it's hard also because it's like I still do get you know I bring things up to people and I'm like hey this person is you know doing this or has like right wing ideology or it has another project that like fucking sucks like what's up with this can we change it like I don't like this at all and being dismissed because I'm not like a bro and can't bro down. Um, so it's just been like, it's been, it's been difficult and I'm glad to kind of like remove myself from that world a little bit at this point. Uh, and it's also like, it's really hard because there's so much shitty stuff in metal that goes on that like, that like the woke left doesn't know about yet. Like there are bands on the left who have terrible people in them that I, you know, have dealt with like personally and people don't, people don't know and they still support them. And it's just like, it's, it's a really, it's just like a frustrating zone and very sad um, and incredibly complicated to work within. But yeah, historically I have felt, viewed like my, role in it as like infiltrating that space and being like you have to contend with me as well um but it, again it, like it is complicated i'm sure there are some things i haven't handled the right way it's just it's hard it's hard to know what the right thing to do is yeah how has switching to sergeant house now um has that changed the context for you at all has that changed the zones that you start to appear in is that something that you talk about with <clears throat> kathy uh, yeah yeah absolutely um kathy has been a real lifesaver for me um and has taught me you know one of the most valuable things that she's taught me is to value myself and that I don't just have to go along and say yes to everyone and do what everyone says and like be dismissed and like open for all of these metal bands for the rest of my foreseeable life mm -hmm. and that instead of like instead of you know being like categorized and like cataloged with with metal that i can make my own thing mm -hmm. and be be the best at my own thing and so starting to do like the headlining tours you know even they were though they were smaller shows um 
and gradually getting bigger um, that has been like incredibly helpful because it's like then I don't have to like I don't have to be a fucking like metal bro I'm so tired of trying and mm. uh, <laughs> and I just like I get to be myself and like mm. it's like now like I finally get to like wear the clothes that I want to wear because like people would make fun of the way I looked and shit and like I can make the music I actually want to make and not feel like I have to be pressured into like just being um you know just being like super harsh all the time or like screaming all the time like I get to kind of carve my own path and I'm really happy about that and so you know Sergeant House allows me to do that and it's really really you know it's like I can breathe again kind of mm, that's good to hear yeah um well, speaking of Sergeant House, let's talk about the Unused Day EP, um, which you have up on Bandcamp um, and is coming out soon. The 19th, right? Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Um, and um, each track on there seems to have, I mean, you talked about, I guess, I guess you used the word appropriating these different things um, and, you know, borrowing things from different zones. But in, in Unused Day in particular, it seems like each track seems to have a nod to some other piece of work. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell us where you're pointing and why on that EP? Um, yeah, I wanted to create um, just a collection of stuff that was like more kind of explicitly in exploring classical versus noise um, and then exploring like appropriated text plus classical plus noise and um and so mostly sticking with like kind of religious ideology although the the Hesse poem is not particularly religious but just looking at um all of these zones and creating kind of a different voice or a, a specific or very specific vibe within each song. Um, the, the, I mean, the sole exception might be the Iron Loan cover, which is like, I love that song, Sexless No Sex. It's one of my favorite songs. And Iron Lung is one of my favorite like power violence bands. Um, and trying to capture something more kind of trying to capture like the melodic element of a power violence and giving it a really uh, dramatic um almost like operatic hue and then i was really surprised that people liked the the i'm used day um the bach piece which is so like long and tedious and dirge like um but I just wanted to like put something in there that's actual like I don't think I have any anything out yet that's just like kind of real classical singing. And it's not entirely, but it's like it's close. It's like in my kind of contralto range. Um, so yeah, it was just wanting to collect something that's like specifically going down this one direction that is part of the many directions of the project previously. As a classically trained vocalist, have mm -hmm. you discovered any gems of that uh, world that the modern world has left behind and you feel everyone should should hear? Um, what do you mean exactly? Just a, a piece of music that, that you feel um, is close to you and, and isn't um, talked about enough, I guess. Yeah, I mean, there's all there's so much stuff. Um, I, um, there's this aria by, um, the composer Sartorio, um, called Orfeo to Dormi. I had to, I heard it on, um, I, I feel like I may have just been browsing YouTube or something. And I heard this singer, Patricia Pettibon sing it. She's fantastic. Um, and I was like, this is insane. It's so beautiful. And it took me so fucking long to track down the score. And I eventually found it at the UCSD library, um, like just in score form in some like random book of like 
Baroque arias and found it. And now it's like in, you know, I, I have forever, I'll hold on to it forever, uh, that particular copy, because I didn't make any others. But, um, but yeah, that's a, that's a really amazing one. Um, the work of... Uh, hmm. I mean, I think I think a lot of people that I that I like uh, classically are also people that are known in in, in modern academia, at least. Um, I love like Carlo Gesualdo. Um, he's a super we- weird one, um, total madman and a murderer as well. Um, and his <laughs> polyphonic work is like just bananas and super chromatic and very strange and weird. And actually Herzog made a film about him, um, or a documentary. Um, and he's one of, he's one of my favorites. Uh, yeah, just like lots of like strange medieval chanson and uh that's that shit is all my jam um you, that reminds me you you asked us what was the herzog movie that that got the ball rolling on herzog for us what was it for you what was the movie that got you going the first one i saw was even dwarves started small yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> which is a very which is a probably a really good one to start with mm-hmm. um and i think it came from we uh my friend uh, Andy and I, who was uh, my high school, like one, one of my best friends in high school, um, and we would watch movies and read books together. Uh, we were really into like Harmony Corinne. And um, is it Corinne or Corinne? I, thought I it was say Corinne. Me too. Really? Yeah. Okay. I have historically said Corinne, but I think I've hear, heard most people say Corinne at this point. So Harmony Corinne, we were watching like all of his stuff. We were watching gum on if we're like 14 years old or whatever and uh and uh julian donkey boy as well and the the person at kensington video in san diego was like if you guys like harmony corinne you would also like Werner herzog he's kind of like wow a major, yeah a major precursor to to harmony corinne's work and so we're like oh, okay cool and he gave us even dwarf started small for some reason it's like he was you know daring cranky. you yeah <laughs> um <laughs> And, uh, and so we watched it and we were just like, what the fuck? This is insane. And then we just like devoured everything else of his that we could. Uh, Kin- Kinski would always call him the dwarf director. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's, it's, uh, that's a, such a wild film. Totally bananas. So we basically have one last question before we move into uh, Lucas's final segment. Um, but I was wondering from you um lingua ignota means lingua ignota means unknown language yes right um so what what's an unknown language that that you or your music speaks in that's failed to be understood if there is one I think I think I would say it is a language based in trauma, which is in itself not communicable um, and is can be somewhat a shared experience, but can also be a totally singular experience. Mm -hmm. And so I think trying to find ways to like kind of almost desperately gathering bits and pieces of other languages to form this new language that speaks to this pain and suffering um, in a way that, um, that no other operating language, um, does try like it's 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 almost like a language of failure because that you can't do it like you can't communicate these things there there are not words there's not music there's not anything that can touch it almost 
So to me, it's it, and the project is about in that in some ways, like in, about failure. Um, so yeah, so to me, I think it's about tr- like reaching, constantly reaching for expressing a thing that cannot be expressed. Wow, amazing That's answer! Fantastic. Thank you. Fantastic answer. Thank well, you. I have a, a silly, silly new segment that I call Care to Comment. Oh, uh, yes. Where I'm going to quote you from Twitter, and <laughs> you can you can decide to comment or decide to not comment on the context of these tweets. Okay. Right? So here we go. First one. I do what Seth calls juggalo vocals on this collab, and I just want to make sure everyone is aware that this is now a thing in my wheelhouse you may request. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I definitely do. Um, on the Sightless Pit record, uh, that's, uh, I do one song where I was like, you know what, let's, I want to do a really weird pattern, uh, in the vocals. And it was, it was a harsh vocal moment. And so I do like this weird triplet thing that sounds extremely juggalo. Um, and... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and and I think Dylan was like a little bit horrified uh, Dylan being one of the other uh, members that, in the project Dylan Walker and like I walked back into the room and everyone was kind of like <laughs> <laughs> like what what was that and and Seth was like yo it's juggalo vocals it's so <laughs> sick and I was like all right let's keep it it stays um so yeah that is that's a thing I can I can uh you know, if anyone wants juggalo vocals, I am available. <laughs> it's good to know. Glad yeah. our audience knows that. Yes. Um, having a body is absolute trash. <laughs> has constant has constant needs, but doesn't do what you want. Outside looks weird. Inside is exponentially worse. <laughs> Feels very bad every day. Must lug same one around the whole time. Constant decay. Must watch in horror. Death is final <laughs> surprise. This is all in all caps, by the way. In classic, classic lingua. Yeah. Care to comment or no comment? <laughs> no comment. Okay, wonderful. That, that speaks for itself. Yep. Yeah. Um, I am at a Best Western in buttfuck nowhere, and it feels like I'm on tour again. I have old hummus in a bag, and I don't want to talk to anyone. Care to comment? <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly what it's like to be on tour. So true. Something about the hummus, <laughs> man. Why is there hummus everywhere? There really is. That's all there is. Tour yeah. is just hummus and not wanting to talk to anyone. <laughs> I, I like discovered this disturbing reality that like anytime you watch like your most beloved artist performing, like there's like a ninety five percent chance they just ate hummus. <laughs> Like Bjork or whoever, just like, oh man, like fuck. Show some hazing, but she just ate hummus. Damn, dude. They're in the they're in the back with a fucking can of Sabra hummus. If they're lucky. <laughs> yeah, Sabra if you're lucky. Alright. Okay. Uh okay, I will bite four ce- uh okay, I will bite. Four celebs people tell me I look like, and then attached are four pictures of literal dumpster fires. <laughs> care to comment (laughs) no (laughs) okay strong um playing in milan tonight for today's italian lesson i learned how to say fuck you and by the sandals of jesus be damned (laughs) care to comment (laughs) yeah um my tour manager in europe um federico is amazing is a really wonderful uh wonderful man with a great sense of humor and a true italian um and uh one of the ways we would pass time in the van is he would teach me different uh, blasphemies and different curses in Italian and just like totally (laughs) um, lots of like curses involving, I don't remember any of them now, I was probably concussed Um, but like lots of animals uh, the mother of Jesus is a donkey fucker, things like that, just like really wonderful um, huge and and true yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, F- Fed is great. Uh, I miss him a lot. Shout out. Um, Shout out to Fed. My love language is being wordlessly handed a Totino's pizza roll by my significant other. <laughs> yeah, that's it. On that one, care to comment? 
Yeah, um, Alexis loves Totina's pizza rolls, um, and he makes, he's going to get mad, but uh, he makes an, the entire thing and eats it, the entire, like, the entire bag of Totino's and eats eats it out of a bowl, and we'll just be watching The Bachelor or something, and he'll just put one up to my face, and that's it. I don't even want it. It's just there, and I have to take it kind of beautiful yeah um this one's my favorite and this is the last one um all caps of course uh no posting is true ego death 2020 those who are no longer posting are free (laughs) yeah it's true (laughs) um i think i think yeah i wish i had the power to no longer post i -hmm. wish i was free same yeah must be nice <laughs> <laughs> well um is there uh you have the ep coming out in a couple days on the 19th is there anything else that you would like to use our massive platform to plug here no wonderful i don't happy think i'm going to plug happy to hear it Thank you so much for coming on, Kristen. Thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. I'll just give a little quick update about how we played. Uh, Not very good. That last (laughs) game, last game I could have won on the first turn and I just, I I just, I misplayed it. You know, that's fine. It happens. (laughs) But we, I think, went uh, two and two. So not terrible. Usually these decks seem a lot worse than they are. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes the deck's bad, but the player is good. Um, so wow. anyway, that that's the update for that. Um, Kristen, thank you so much for for coming on this uh, coming on the show and and being so honest and um, talking with us about you know some big stuff. Yeah, of course, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. All right, I'm gonna play our outro music by Durain Strangler and thank you all for joining us Uh, we'll be back next week at 5pm Pacific Time on Monday Um, goodbye bye